Good afternoon. Welcome to this talk. I'm glad you all showed up here. I'm going to talk about easy ways to tune OpenMP code. We all know if we spend enough time on something, we can probably get some achievement. Here I'm going to look at what I call the low hanging. One of my pet peeves is that people say OpenMP does not perform. And my claim is you can get good performance out of pretty much any OpenMP program. And your code will scale. But you have to do things in the right way. And one of the, the things I recognize is not, not everything has been documented very well. So how could you know? And that's why I made this talk to help clarify some of the performance mysteries that I see. Here's a very simple inequality. The fact that a language is easy doesn't mean you can write stupid code. When you write stupid code, you'll probably get stupid performance, maybe a little bit better than, than that, but not much, because there's not much the compiler can do for you. All right. So that's what I'll go, I'm going to talk about. So definitely, the ease of use of OpenMP is a mixed blessing. Uh, it's quite easy to get your OpenMP up and running, um, but then it won't scale, maybe. That's, that's when things get hard. So you have your prototype running uh, very quickly. You implement your idea, but maybe the performance is not as good as you expected it to be. One of the things is what not everybody realizes is that some things are more expensive than others. And you sort of have to know about that. All right? So, and as I'll show, a relatively small change can have quite a big impact. And that's actually what you're looking for. That's what I mean, the low-hanging fruit you do get better performance with a small change. Okay. So that's, again, that's the focus of this talk. So let's look at some of those things. First of all, never forget to tune your code for single thread performance. Very often that's ignored. People think, well, I can skip it. I'm interested in parallel computing. But think about it. Okay. What if your program doesn't run well on one core? What do you think will happen on 2, or 10, or 20, or 100? It'll get worse. And there's, there's a lot of theory behind that, why that is. But the bottom line is, don't ignore single thread performance, all right? And another thing is, don't be blinded by scalability. It tends to be that if somebody only quotes scalability, you have to be careful. Because slow codes scale better, in general. So always ask for the, the time. Always ask, well, how long did this run take? And I'll actually show you a little example of that. All right. I'm now going to go through a checklist. And um, that may be obvious to you, but I thought I'll just memorize it, uh, repeat it. Don't parallelize what doesn't matter. I talk to too many users who just parallelize every loop in their program. That's not a good idea. All right. You need to use a profiling tool. I don't care what you use. There are several profiling tools out there. They tell you where the time is spent, and that's what you focus on. Right. Another golden rule is, although OpenMP is very easy with sharing data, don't share data unless you have to. Be very careful. Only use, private, only use share data when you have to. Use private data as long as you can, as much as you can. Another common thing I'll, I see often is multiple parallel fours or parallel do in Fortran. So what I say, one is fine, more is evil. And I'll, I'm going to show that with an example. Think big. Maximize the size of your parallel regions. Don't have all these tiny parallel regions because each, each parallel region has overhead. And that will cost you performance. Seems simple, but I see too many applications that violate that rule. All right. So here's an example of what I just said. Here I have one parallel four with a code block, all right? And I have a whole sequence of them. And again, I see that in too many applications. Well, think about it. This is a fully blown parallel region. So you get all the overhead with that. And there's a barrier at the end. And barriers are expensive, and they definitely impact your scalability. So this is generally not a good solution. So we, don't, we shouldn't be doing that. Again, the overhead is repeated. And you can't use the OpenMP no wait clause, which I think is very useful. Instead, what you do, you set up one parallel region. And within that, just the OMP4. 
it's exactly the same, but faster. And if relevant, there's opportunities for the no weight clause. And certainly a no weight at the end, because this one has an implied barrier already. And you may wonder, doesn't the compiler do that for you? Not that I know. Now, technically, a compiler could detect that and leave out the no weight. I don't think they go that far. So do that yourself. Write it like this. And you'll, you'll immediately see better performance. All right. All right, more basics. Again, barriers are important. You need them for correctness, but use them with care. Don't sprinkle them all over your code just in case. I've seen people locking you know, sing, sequential code with a barrier. Like, no, you don't need that. Okay. Same is true for locks and critical regions. They are expensive. Okay. You need them for correctness, but be careful when to use them and how often to use them. Right. And really, everything matters. When you go for scalability, Sam Dahl's law, even the small things do matter. So take that into account as well. Right. Here's another example. This is from a, a real code. It's actually a benchmark code. And um, I've sort of stripped it down a bit. And what it is, it's a single region, and right after that, a barrier. I see some of you smile or even laugh. Yes, that's really dumb code. All right. So we all, we all should know there's a barrier here. So that barrier is redundant, but it will still cost performance. And admittedly, it's fast, because any weighting would have been done in this barrier, the first one, but still. Again, think about scalability. It'll cost you cycles. As you add threads, that cost will go up as well. The cost of the barrier will grow. So bad idea, very simple fix. And this is really from a real life benchmark I downloaded from a website. I mean, this is not made up stuff. So this is what I just said. Think about those, those kind of opportunities. It's absolutely low hanging. And you don't have to worry about correctness of your code. That's, that's guaranteed. Here's one more complex. I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time on it. Again, was from the same application. An array value gets assigned. Let's, let's call that uh, index value endpoint. Then there's a parallel region. Inside that parallel region, there's an OMP4, okay, and another one, and some code. Now, what's bad about this, or potentially bad about this? First of all, two barriers. Both OMP4 will end with a barrier. I would think there's a no wait opportunity here for this one because this assignment is not, not related, but it's not there. So the compiler will in insert a barrier. So you get two barriers. You have the cost of the infrastructure repeated twice. The OMP4 goes through some logic, so that'll cost you performance. And the same for this one. And each for loop always carries some overhead, although minimal. The worst thing on this example is that the value of endpoint. What if endpoint is five? You're going to parallelize a loop five long, and then potentially this, this value n is, is fairly high in general. But this one could be really slow because endpoint is not big enough. Right. So this is not going to work very well. The fix, so this is what I just said. There are two barriers. You get the overhead. And the, the performance benefit depends on particular on endpoint and n. But n is usually very large, like at least tens of thousands of, of elements. Yeah. All right? So when you see what they're trying to do is assign a value in that array, then assign, assign the first part, barrier, second part, barrier. That does not look like a very smart implementation of just taking the whole array and assigning that value. Yeah. That's, I don't know how somebody can actually write code like that, but it exists. All right. So the fix, once you've seen this, the fix is really easy. You just assign the whole array to minus one, and in a single, with a no way, you, you fix that one value that was wrong. But you know it was wrong, and you know where to fix it. Now, this, the, the performance of this loop only depends on n, I only have one barrier, so all good things happen here. Again, from an implementation point of view, really simple to do. Uh, okay. So now let's look at a case study. The application is the good old Graph 500 benchmark. 
uh, for a while, there was an OpenMP version. That's what we talk about. The, this base benchmark does the following. It, it constructs a graph depending on your parameters. It's an undirected graph of a specified size. You specify the size. Then it will select a key, and it will search for that key using a BFS search. Right? Then it will verify that the result is a tree, and you do that for the next key. And in total, you do that for 64 keys benchmark. So that's the, that's the benchmark. For the benchmark score, for the list, only the search time matters. Yeah. And the reason I selected this example is that's very typical in a real application. You only want to follow one path. You don't care about a lot of other things. You want to optimize a certain path. So in this case, we want to optimize the search time. All right. So I have to describe how I ran this. I, the code takes a parameter called scale. Scale to 24. That's a very small graph, only 9 gigabyte, really small. All right. I ran that in our own Oracle Cloud. I used the Skylake instance, only eight cores and 16 threads, so very small configuration. But interesting enough, as, as I hope to show to you, all right, I used our own Oracle Linux and the DCC 8 compiler. All right. And I used our own performance tool to, to make the profiles that I'm showing. But again, use whatever you, whatever you prefer. All right. Here's what, I, what we call the timeline. The time, is from, uh, the time is from left to right. And each function here, each snapshot here is the call stack of the code. So we look at where you were in the program. And normally, each, each function will get its own color. But I grayed out everything I don't care about. I only highlight the top, the top level functions. So it gives me a feel for the dynamic behavior. But underneath are these, these other functions that are being called. And this part is the graph generation. This little kind of thing sticking out is a recursive sorting. That's why it's the call, call stack is quite deep. All right. And then, then there's the search and verification phase repeated 64 times. In the next slides, red is the search, blue is the verification. All right. Here's the initial performance. And I'm showing uh, the search time. I, I don't care about the benchmark as a metric, but I like to work with real time. I mean, this is real time, how long the search takes, the number of OpenMP threads. Remember, I had eight cores, two threads per core, so I could go all the way up to 16, 16 threads. And the dotted line is the parallel speed up scale to the single thread performance, right? Um, the good news is there is benefit from adding threads. We do see a reduction in time, so that's good. And it can go all the way to 16 hyperthreads. That's not a given, but this, this example, I can use all the hyperthreads. The bad thing is I only get 3.2x speed up. So that's not good. Okay, that's very low for 16. Yeah. So plan, use again, use a profiling tool. All right. And I found several opportunities to fix the code. Some of them I've just shown, okay, in a, in a cleaner context. But some of these things were actually in this code that I just talked about. And um, although small changes, the improvement is rather dramatic. What you see is the, uh, the search time. The dark blue is the modified code. We see that the search time single thread is the same. That's always a good sanity check. Make sure that you didn't ruin it in some way, some unexpected way. So this is the same. Actually, on two threads, the time is the same. And that goes back to what I've said before. It's about scalability. So on two threads, you don't see a difference. But then it starts taking off. And ultimately, you get pretty nice performance. So here we see initially no benefit. Then there's benefit here. And ultimately, the search time is two times faster. Really low-hanging fruit. And, and related to that, the parallel speed up goes up to like almost 7 instead of 3.2, right? Are we done yet? That's the hardest part in performance tuning. You never know when you're finished. So I decided to explore a little further. And um, it's encouraging. It you know, gets you going. Um, not bad. But let's look at the dynamic behavior of the threads. All right. Again, this timeline now for one thread and two threads. and. At this level, it looks fairly well, but let's zoom in. Okay, both are faster. 
both the initialization and the search and verification benefit, all good stuff. Until you zoom in. Now what you see, the master thread is fine, but the second thread has gaps in the execution. All right? And when you zoom in some more, you see that. And actually when you look very closely, you'll all see it's always in the red part. There's always the search. So for some reason, the thread has to work in the, in the, in the search phase. Sometimes problems go away as you increase the problem size or different thread count. So always do that sanity check. This is what I did. Four threads is actually worse. Okay. And um, you have to believe me a little. I have some more data on that. But four threads, it gets worse as you add threads. So I, look, I looked into the source code. The profiler was telling me, I'm not spending a lot of time here. And I don't, this is not the right forum to go through source code in detail. But I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate the highlights. The highlights are, this is a OMP4 with a very regular structured parallel loop. That's fine. But this loop actually depends on the loop, the loop counter k, the loop iteration variable. So the work here is no longer regular. It's not the same for different values of k. Well, that, then alarm, alarm bells should go off. And to make that a little bit worse, there's an if statement here. So depending on whether that if is true or not, you'll do more or less work. In other words, this is a classical example of load imbalance. All right. Well, knowing that, the fix is extremely easy. So instead of using the default static scheduling that pretty much every compiler uses for a regular loop, you can go to dynamic or guided. I like to use the runtime clause. And with the runtime clause, I set at runtime, in this case, I set it to dynamic scheduling with a chunk size of 25. The value of 25 is trial and error. You have to give it some tries, find the right value. It's hard to predict, but that's what I did. All right? And here's the benefit. So the, the blue one, this is the original code, the bad one. And actually, you see here, the modified version is slightly slower. And the reason is dynamic is more expensive. That's why compilers like static scheduling because it's so cheap to do. It's very small. I think it's in the order of 1% or so, so very small. But it's noticeable. And after that, it starts to take off. All right? So we see a little bit of slowdown. Now, now there's about almost linear scaling for all eight cores in my system. The second thread helps a little bit. I mean, why wait? I get it. So pretty good scaling overall. And it gives me. A performance improvement. And I hope you all agree that was not a lot of work. Most of the work was actually picking profiles and things going on, but from an implementation point of view, it's you know, very small. All right, sanity check. And indeed, on um, this case, on eight threads, nicely balanced instead of all these gaps. So it's doing the right thing. Conclusions? Again, 2x, very easy to get. Then the realization was this is an irregular workload using dynamic scheduling, or you could try guided, which I did as well. Dynamic was the best one for this. Gave me a total of 3x performance improvement. And really, you have to do this with a tool. How else would I know this? So again, think about what tool you want to use and pick it, but never forget to use a, a profiling tool. All right. Said that many times. I'm done. Thank you. Stay tuned, as always. Thank you. And any questions? You're all going to look back at your own code and like, oh boy. <laughs> so, all right.